Welcome to our Shepherd's Chapel Bible Study. It's so great that you could all join us today, and please join us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. Every day is an opportunity that I pray for all of us that we do not miss all the opportunities that you bring forward to us to serve you. And by serving you, we are serving your creation those that you have created to, to come forth and many these days have turned away from you. And there are some that, that do honor and worship you. But we're going to be studying your word today that shows us both sides of the coin. And I pray, dear Lord, that you allow us to have the opportunity to receive the fullness of thy word this day. Father, also, we give you thanks for all the things that are happening behind the scenes, those things that really we are unaware of in many cases, but we realize that you are there every step of the way, and we thank you for that. We thank you for helping us through times of trouble and heartache and agony and pain, sorrow and suffering, but also when we're on the mountaintop, when everything is going well, you are still our God, and we thank you for all of that. We also pray, dear Lord, all these unspoken prayers before you <coughs> at this time. We pray knowing, dear Lord, that you not only hear these prayers, but we thank you for answering them, each and every one, always in perfect season. What a blessing it is to serve you. Also, Father, before you, we bring before you in prayer Chanley's, Owenby's, Graves, and the Deaver families. Also, dear Lord, all uh, those that are at Stone Creek Rehab Center. Also, Lee, Melissa, Bernard, Pastors Murray, Fisk, and Fultz. On all these, Father, we ask that you lead, that you guide, that you direct, that you touch, and that you heal in Yahshua's precious holy name. And as always, Father, we, we pray for all those who have come and gone from our chapel, wherever they are, whatever they are doing, we pray, dear Lord, that they have not forsaken thy word, and they have not forsaken prayer time with you, and they will return to the sheepfold soon. And as always, Father, we pray for Israel, in our nation, for thy kingdom to come, knowing that it will be thy will that will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, to which we await, and we say, come, Lord, come. And we pray for those first responders every day they are on the front lines helping your children, as well as our military who are in arm's way, or who are about to go into arm's way, for their safety and speedy return home. And as always, Father, we pray for the lost those that do not have an opportunity this day to receive thy truth. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see. I pray that you open up our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written, as it will be you that speaks to us through thy scriptures this day. In Yahshua's name we pray. <coughs> Amen. Thank Amen. you, Father. <coughs> um, before I get started, we have a lot to cover today, really, but it, it's on my heart. <coughs> Excuse me, still sinus problems. Um, why I believe, I mean, you would think it's self-explanatory, but why I believe it is so vitally important for someone to accept the Lord Jesus Christ right now, if they haven't. Something's been on my heart lately since Thanksgiving, and it's a story, and it, it wasn't a big story, and I don't remember where it was, who it was, and up to this moment, I believe they still don't know how it happened, just that it happened. But there was a, a man, I guess a, a father of, of children, and they were having their, <coughs> excuse me, their... Um, Thanksgiving dinner, and they're all at the table enjoying the love of God and the 
At least I pray he knew God. But they were having their Thanksgiving meal. And right in the middle of the meal, uh, they don't know where it came from, only from outside of the home, but all of a sudden, a bullet came through the window and hit the man in the head. And uh, it was a stray bullet, uh, as I understand, from somewhere, and killed him right instantly, right in front of his family. Now, that might be shocking to you, and I, I can understand why, but I'm not doing this to shock you. I'm doing this for all of us to understand we don't know how long we have. It might be years, it might be weeks, it might be moments, but it's important that we understand without God we don't have eternity. Without Christ in our lives, we've, we're lost. And we're going to be dealing with this today in Scripture. So just keep that in mind. It's, a, it's vitally important to our Father, and it should be vitally important to you. Enough said on that. Today we're coming to Psalms 52. And um, we're going to uh, see very quickly here, we're going to be dealing, starting off with, a type or even in... in the reality of today of the Antichrist. So with that being said, Psalm 52, it says, To the chief musician, Meshkel, a psalm of David, when Doeg, the Edomite, this gives you a time frame, came and told Saul, who was the king at the time, and said unto him, David is come to the house of Ahimelech. Now, we're not going to cover it today, because it's a whole other study, but if you want to, go to 1 Samuel, and in 1 Samuel chapter 21, you will learn of this, of what, what transpired, especially around, excuse me, verse 7. Now, starting off here in verse 1, uh, David's talking about the evil of the day, but this also being prophecy of not only what would come, but what is even in living in this world today in the form of an Antichrist. Now, again, Antichrist doesn't mean um, against Christ, like anti. It means instead of, which means there's coming a day, as Second Thessalonians chapter 2 clearly states, that the Antichrist is going to be coming here claiming that he's God, sitting in the temple of God, and the whole world will be whoring after him. That's why in the seventh trump, seventh seal, and seventh vial, when the true Christ returns, that those good, well-meaning Christians that follow the Antichrist, thinking that he's Jesus Christ, will want the mountains to fall on them. Those aren't my words. Those are our Father's words. And I pray... You are open to that someday, if you are not already. But it starts in verse 1. It says this, Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? It's a question. Why are you, why are you boasting yourself, O strong man, O mighty man? Now, again, this is going to be the form of Antichrist. And that's exactly what the Antichrist did. He boasted himself. Remember, he was the guardian cherub that covered the mercy seat. God himself promoted him to that position, as it's written in, in, in Genesis. Those of you that don't understand that, put that off on the shelf for now and, and, and do some homework and study of, of, of Genesis. But also, um, our past studies of Mark of the Beast would be a good place to start for you if you haven't studied it already. It's in our archives. But it says, Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? The goodness of God endureth continually. So, he's saying basically here, why boast in doing mischief, or why are you boasting in doing evil? To be boasters of evil things is the character of Antichrist and his followers. 
So this is going to be our subject. Listen to verse 2. Thy tongue, what comes out of your mouth? Thy tongue deviseth or <coughs> plans destruction, plans mischief. Like a sharp razor working deceitfully. That's, that's all he does. Now this basically is what the Antichrist is up to these days. And we're going to find out in the next psalm what happens to people who jump on his bandwagon and don't even know that they're doing it. Yes? <clears throat> I think we may have spoke about this before. And this is just my, my view. It's not, I can't document it right now. But, you know how with, with Flyway Doctrine, people boast that the church is going to be taken out. Yes. Okay, isn't that kind of like the opposite of humility? To think that you're so good, you're going to be removed from this world. It can be. So maybe that what they're getting by the church being removed might possibly be the candlesticks being removed rather well, than the church. Well, body. when you say candlesticks being removed, and you're 100% correct, what do you mean by that? Their, their knowledge of, of what the key of David is and, and the truth. The truth of what we're reading mm -hmm. here. The truth about flyaway doctrine. Mm -hmm. The truth about the rapture. Because the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, then why do they teach rapture? Confusion. It is confusion. But, you know, a lot of it is done innocently because mm -hmm. that's what they've been taught. They believe in what man has told them about God instead of going to God's Word and having God teach them about man. That's the difference. But God is the one that has to reveal that to a person. Let's not forget that. Because that the only ones that will be turning away from the Antichrist in the last days are God's elect. Because God has opened their eyes to them because he knows he can count on them. Different subject for a different time. That's why the whole world, when it says the whole world, we're, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. You know, and that's... To know that and understand that is very, it should be very humble and makes you a servant, not to rise above with the knowledge that you have above all else, all others. No. Mm -hmm. It's to make you servant of everyone. And be ready. And be ready. Verse 3 says, Thou, again, who are we talking about? We're talking about the Antichrist. Thou lovest evil more than good. You say, I don't understand that. Well, good. I hope you don't understand that because it makes no sense why a person would love evil over good. But especially the Antichrist loves evil over good. And all those that follow him is the same way. And lying rather than to speak righteousness. Instead of speaking what is right, they lie all the time. And it says, Selah, stop, listen. Listen to what was just said. I'm going to connect this to the next verse is what Selah means. Verse 4. Thou lovest all devouring words. Those words that will confuse. Those things that will uh, um, uh, cause disruption in life. Uh, those words that basically, call, it's called babble in the end times. It's babbling words that people, oh, they sound good, they sound religious, they sound right, but it's going completely against our Father's Word. And if you don't know our Father's Word, you're going to take it in hook, line, and sinker. That's why there's so many people that aren't even requiring people to bring Bibles anymore. They put it up on the big screen or uh, pass out these sheets of paper of what they're going to talk about. And that's another reason why they're bouncing all over the Bible. They're going from this this uh, chapter over to this chapter over here, read a verse or two, and then going to this chapter, read a verse or two. Our Father wrote this a specific way. He wrote it subject, object, and article on every single chapter. That's why it's important to start and finish of how our Father wrote it, so you won't be confused. So thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. Verse 5. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. Has this happened yet? No. 
Remember, when Jesus came, Jesus said, Get thee hence. In other words, get thee behind me, Satan. In other words, Satan was removed. His fleshly, not fleshly, but his, 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 his existence on this planet. But what was allowed to continue is the spirit. The spirit of evil. You say, well, why didn't he remove it then? To give people an opportunity to make a choice. Whether or not to accept the Lord or whether or not to accept the things of this world which is governed by the Antichrist. So it says, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. And that will happen at the end of the millennium. He will be uh, burnt from within as it is written. Blotted out from existence. He shall take thee away. And this is prophecy of what will happen, not only to Satan, but all those on his bandwagon as well, and all those who refuse God. And pluck thee out of thy dwelling place, and root thee out of the land of the living. Now he did that. That has happened. Well, when did he do that? When Jesus Christ came, and before he suffered his crucifixion. When, when Satan, remember, Satan took uh, Jesus to the wilderness. Well, Jesus went to the wilderness, and he was approached by the Antichrist, or by Satan. And Satan gave him all these different things that he would give to Jesus if Jesus would bow down and worship him. And at the end of all that, Satan's, or Jesus said to Satan, Get thee hence, get thee behind me. In other words, at that point, Satan had no power over uh, death. Satan had no power on this planet being here de facto. Satan was removed from this planet and placed on the other side of that uh, great gulf fixed or in the kingdom, if you will. Again, different subject for a different time. But, again, what is left here is his spirit. If you believe in Holy Spirit, you have got to believe in evil spirit. If you don't believe in evil spirit, just turn on your television. Just watch the news. Watch people's actions. Watch what things are happening. It makes absolutely no sense today. What is right seems wrong. What is wrong seems right. Do you think that's of God or the anti-God? Just keep that in mind. Um, verse 6 the righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him meaning what? there's going to come a day if it hasn't already happened it has happened to God's elect but for the rest of God's children there's going to come a day when they're going to see Satan for who and what he truly is and what he has truly done to the people of this planet, all of his creation. Our Father is saying to you, there's going to come a time that you will see him for what he truly is. That's why when, when the true Christ returns, the true Christ that's why so many people will want the mountains to fall on them. They're going to be running and hiding away from the true Jesus Christ. Why? Because at that moment, they're going to realize they had been lied to all their life. At that moment, they're going to realize for the last five months, they had been worshiping an antichrist instead of Jesus Christ. Again, those are my words. Those are our Father's words. But they believe it now. They teach it now. Now think about that. By doing that, you're turning away from the true God. You're true, turning away from the true Christ. But they don't see that. They basically say teachings like this are of the devil itself. But it's true gospel. It's 100% correct. And I will have to stand before my God someday and give an account for what I taught from these words. And I take this very seriously. I put my stake in eternity on it. So, and I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you say, well, how do you know you're right and they're wrong? Because of what our Father is doing to me and for me and through me these days. I mean, I, I could spend the rest of our time together giving an account of the blessings 
in my life. The overwhelming joy and security that I have of when I walk. I mean, I used to walk in ignorance. I used to believe in the fly away and the rapture and, and all that apple in the garden of Eden. I used to buy it all. But when the Lord got a hold of me through his word and opened up for me the fullness, the mysteries of God as it's written in God's word, the understanding of scriptures, I wasn't listening anymore to man. I was listening to my father. And when that happened, when I gave every ounce of my being to him and his word, everything changed, as it should. And it will for you, if you trust him. And we're going to get in very quickly of those that don't trust him, what happens. So the righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. That's the Antichrist. Lo, verse 7, this is the man that made not God his strength. Let's not forget the first earth, first heaven age when uh, Lucifer, as he was called back then, morning star, uh, don't forget he's always a copier. I mean, Christ is also called the morning star. <coughs> but when Lucifer, were, Lucifer was promoted to that guardian cherub over the mercy seat as it is written that at that point what did he do instead of covering the mercy seat he wanted to be the one sitting in it in other words he wanted to be our christ and what did he do as it's written it what is it uh genesis 6 i think he drew a third of god's children away from our father in the eternal kingdom now in heaven while we're all in spiritual bodies. And he drew a third of God's children away from him. And that's when uh, he did not put God as his strength. He put himself as his strength. And this is going to happen again. Let's not forget that. What we're reading about now, this is going to happen again at the sixth trump, sixth seal, and sixth vial when the Antichrist will return to this earth. But he's not coming as Antichrist to the multitude of people. He's coming as Jesus Christ. He's going to be claiming that he's God. Sitting in the temple of God, claiming that he is God. Again, read it for yourself. Don't take my word for it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 declares it so clearly that only a fool would de deny that truth. You say, well, that's pretty... That's pretty raw. It should be raw. I'm trying to get your attention. Because those that will not accept God's truth is a fool. And those aren't my words. Listen, I'll, I'll cover it in a minute. But trusted in the abundance of his riches. Let me, let me start over on that verse. Lo, this is the man, that's Antichrist, that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So he strengthened. You say, well, how did, how did he get all these riches? Let's not forget. The Antichrist owns this world. It belongs to God. When I mean own it, I, maybe the wrong term. He runs things. He's the one pulling the strings right now. And our Father said that would happen. That's why when, when uh, Christ was here, de facto, before his crucifixion, in Jerusalem, and, and when he went into the wilderness, and, and the Antichrist came up to him, he basic, basically said, the Antichrist said to Jesus, well, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these things. Because he basically runs everything. And he still runs everything. If you don't think he doesn't, just open your eyes and look what's happening in this world today. Now, he may not run your life, and he doesn't have to. Because if Christ, our Lord, our Heavenly Father is running your life, you don't have to deal with that junk. It's still out there all around you. But you don't have to deal with it. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
that thrown in the fiery furnace, not a hair on their head was singed because Christ was with them. If Christ is with you today, not a hair on your head is going to get singed by what's happening in this world today, whether it be pestilence, whether it be the economy, whether it be education, whether it be religion. It will not affect you. You stick to the true Word of God, the true Christ. But listen to verse 8. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. Now, this is David saying basically when he's in the house of God. Because at this particular moment of time, David was in exile. So he wasn't in Jerusalem. So he's remembering and he's also prophesying of what it is like to be in the house of God. Now, what I'm about to tell you, I want you to understand clearly. You can be in the house of God today, right where you're at. Because you are supposed to be the pillar in the temple of God where God resides. He's supposed to be residing with you. Once you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, once you turn away and repent from your sins, then Father moves in and, and removes all the dregs, removes all the junk, removes all the negatives in your life, step by step by step. Not instantly, but He will cleanse you and make you whole if you want it. And then once that happens, you are basically in the temple of God that he resurrected on the moment of his resurrection from the dead. And you're part of that. You're part of that family. You're grafted into that. Whether you be Jew, Gentile, you're grafted into that if you believe and trust him, if you believe and trust in his word. And then finally in verse 9 it says this, I will praise thee forever. How could you not? Once you have this, once you have the blessings of God, once the negatives have been removed, and you're starting to learn how to become a righteous person, that just means you're doing what's right according to the Word of God. You don't want to do the evil things anymore. You don't want to have the bad behavior anymore. You don't want to be a junkie anymore. You don't want to be an alcoholic anymore. You want to be pure and clean and whole and serve the living God by what He gives you to do by helping people. It could be just not even leaving the house, just helping your own family. And being a different creation, it's called a new creation. You are a new creation that God has now formed and made you whole and made you loving and made you caring and made you a person that he can depend on. And guess what else? Others now can depend on you as well. Where they may have not have been able to depend on you maybe for a long, long, long time. So he says, I will praise thee forever because thou hast done it. Now the manuscript, the ancient uh, Hebrew manuscript, reads this a little bit differently. It says this, I will praise thee forever, but instead of because thou hast done it, it says, the revenge of my judgment. The revenge of my judgment, meaning the vengeance of God on Doeg like what we started with, it, where God, David didn't have to revenge or go against Doeg, that God did it for him. God is the avenger. And once we learn that, a lot of things change in our lives. Why? Because there's a lot of people that come up against us, especially the more we want to walk with the Lord, the more it seems like we have people coming at us and calling us crazy or calling us uh, uh, um, a hypocrite or calling us negative this and negative that. And, and we've, and especially young people today. I was reading an article a little bit before the camera came on today about, and I've known this for quite some time because I was a part of it in growing up and getting into college, but it seems like today's education and let's not forget education is one of the hidden dynasties that Satan is operating now <coughs> why do I say that because of what they're being taught or basically not being taught 
1962-1963, the Bible and prayer was taken out of schools. And ever since that point, it's been getting worse and worse and worse. And now they're, they're teaching against God in the educational system. And that if, if you, you, it's very hard and difficult for a young person to follow God and follow what is being taught in the school system today. And that's even in the college and universities as well. So it's vitally important that we teach children and form their understanding in the Word of God and that they be absolutely, positively sure of what they know about the Lord before they ever even entered the school system. Enough said on that. But listen to Psalms 53 as we continue our study today. Because we were just talking about the Antichrist. And what's the biggest thing that the Antichrist is working on to try to get one of God's children to do? Well, it would be not to believe in God. Not to believe in his word. Not to believe in prayer. And I'm not just talking about heathen. I'm talking about self-proclaimed Christians who believe what they're doing is right. But then they have a bunch of confusion in life. I know people right now, there's no doubt in my mind. Deep down, they love Jesus Christ. And they have been brought out of terrible situations in life. And they are a new creation. But, they're not able to receive the fullness of understanding of our Father's Word. Why? I mean, if, if, if God has given us His Word, don't you think He wants everyone to know and understand it? Of course He does. But you see, there's something that has to happen in a person's life. They have got to let go of preconceived ideas of what man has taught them about God. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of things that man has taught about God over, over the eons. But once a person, in my, my firm belief, once a person fully lets go and say, Father, no matter what it is, no matter what I have to get rid of in my understanding, I want to fo follow only what you would bring to me. Now that's one thing. The other thing, there's another biggie here. And it's written that Father, at times, has sent strong delusion. To some people. Well, you say, well, why, why would he do that? It's like he places blinders over them. Again, why would he do that? Because it's written that the more that is given, the more is required of you. Let me say that again because it's important to understand. The more that is given you, the more our Father requires of you. So, if he knows deep down in your heart that you're not willing to go that next step, you're not willing to let go and let God, he's going to place a blinder over you, but not forever, until the millennial period. Again, some people say, well, why? Because he doesn't want you to be a sinner the rest of your life. He doesn't want you to deny him and his powerful word all of your flesh existence. So he's going to wait. He's patient. He's going to wait until the millennial period when all will be revealed. Because we're not going to be in these flesh bodies anymore. We're all going to be in spiritual bodies. Our mind is going to be 100% open to the clarity of only 
God's word. There will be no Satan, there will be no Lucifer, there will be no evil of any kind for a thousand years. But, at the end of that thousand years, still, at the end of a thousand years of teaching and learning and loving, Satan will be loosed for a short season, as is written in the book of Revelation. A short season, and there will still be a bunch that jump on his bandwagon. I don't understand it now. I definitely won't understand it then, but I know it's going to happen. How do I know? Because it's written, and I believe and trust my God. But in the meantime, you have an opportunity now to receive the fullness. But here's what happens when people jump on Satan's bandwagon, and they don't even know it. very first thing it says in verse 1, the fool, these are my words, it's God's words, the fool has said in his heart or in his mind, there is no God. Now, don't overlook these, the, the, the sentence, this verse. How God looks at this. A person who says there is no God is a fool. To not understand all the blessings in a person's life, all the creation that is in our face 24-7, to say there's no God. There's a problem with them. And the biggest problem is, coming out the gate, they're a fool. Corrupt, are they? Corrupt in their thinking. Corrupt in their knowledge. Corrupt in their understanding. They can't understand. Like Donna said just a few moments ago, the candlestick, that light, has been taken away from them. Be why? God's only given them what they want. They don't want to live, they want to live without God. So guess what? God is going to provide that. You want to live without Him? He's going to allow you to live without Him. It's your free will. Just like it's your free will to accept Him. It's your free will to deny Him. But if you deny Him, He's telling you flat out the gate, you're a fool. You're a fool to do this. And have done abominable uh Iniquity, that means sins. There is none that doeth good. Now, see, a lot of preachers say, well, we all fall short and there's none of us that do any good. That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about those fools. They're not doing anything good. They're not doing anything righteous. No, not one. Verse 2, God looked down from heaven upon the children of men. That's his creation. That means men, women, child alike. To see if there were any that did understand. Understand what? God's word. The knowledge, the mysteries of God. That he's given to us in his word. That did seek God. In other words, the, God looked down and he wants to see people Seeking doctrine, not from man, but God's doctrine. But who is he talking about here? It says in verse 3, listen. Every one of them is gone back. Who, who are they again? Those that say there is no God. Those that are fools. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. You know, I've heard this over and over and over from false doctrine preachers saying, you, there's none of you that are good, none of you, all of you fall short. All of you, no, not one does good. He's not talking about that. He's talking about those fools who deny God. That's the subject. See, that's why it's important to stick to the subject the object, and the article that God gives us in his word. And people want to say, well, there's none of us are, none of you are any good. Yes, yeah, true, we all fall short of the glory of God. We, we can't be God. No matter how good we do in life, we can't be God. Because God is pure. 
God has never sinned. We do. And we need to repent. But that doesn't mean that we're no good. You mean to tell me that God created no good in you? Of course not. Now there's times in our life that we are no good when we do sin against God and we don't repent. We're not doing any good at all. Quite frankly, in God's eyes, we're a fool. Because you should know better. But, that's who he's talking about here. Those that say there's no God. Those that are fools who believe that. Those are the ones that aren't doing any good. And there's no good in them. And you might say, well, well, that's the heathen, beloved. Not necessarily. There's a lot of people out there who believe in all kinds of things. They believe in nature. Nature's their God. Trees are their God. Waterfalls are their God. What, whatever. In other words, anything they put before God is their idol. So this also includes those that <clears throat> put God in a box and just bring them out when they need them? No. Because these are the ones who absolutely say there's no God. Okay. So how are you going to be put, pulling God out yeah. of a box? Okay. No, what you're talking about is the the fair weather Christians. Yeah. Okay. You know, those that, it's as long the, as everything's going well, you know, God's there. But when things aren't going so well, you know, or when things don't go good, they pull God up. But when things are going well, they, God never hears from them. Yeah. Okay. Verse 4. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge. Now, who are the workers of iniquity? The workers of sin. Who are they? Those that say there is no God. And so it says, have the workers of sin no knowledge? They've got knowledge. It might be book knowledge. It might be knowledge of how to, to make a living in this world today. But they have no knowledge of God. They don't trust God. They don't even believe in God. Who eat up my people as they eat bread. What does that mean, eat up my people? They, they're they out there, and you, you hear from them from time to time, if you haven't already. Well, why do you believe in the Bible? The Bible's thousands of years old. There's, there's all kinds of authors, and, and, and it's been changed in this language and that language. How can you... How can you even listen to something like that? A naysayer. Ones that deny God and deny everything that he stands for. These are holy scriptures. Our Father has made sure. Our Father has made sure that his word is coming to you right now. Even though this was penned, this was scribed several thousands of years ago. But it's talking to your heart as if it was pinned yesterday. And it's to give you knowledge not only of past history, but also knowledge of today of what's happening. I mean, look what's happening in the world today with the pestilence and the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the riots and the starvations and the lack of this and the lack of that. And the lack of the word, true word of God being taught today. That is written for today. Telling us what would happen before it ever happened. But it's even telling us what's going to happen. So if, if the history is 100% correct, and today what you read of it is 100% correct, why don't you think tomorrow is going to be 100% correct? Of course it will be. But now with the naysayers, see the negative people, oh, no, 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 it's, this, this ain't good, this... This is just all fictitious, fictitious stuff. Well, it's not. Well, to them it is. But to them there is no God. Can you imagine? Those of you that love Jesus, can you imagine someone not having God? I mean, I, I, I can't because, quite frankly, there's been walks in my life growing up. There were periods of time I did not walk with the Lord. I've had to repent for that. However, I've always known my Father. I've always known that there, there's been a God. Always. I mean, I can never think of a time in my life where I thought there was no God. 
never crossed my mind. So I can't help but think that, hey, he chose me before I was ever born. He chose me. And it doesn't make me greater than anybody else. It makes me a servant of everybody. And thank God he put me in a position where I can serve him now. You know. And he can do the same for you as well. So verse 4 again. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. They don't even believe in him or trust in him. Verse 5. There were they in great fear where no fear was. Now this fear isn't reverence. This fear, it means fear. In other words, do you know anybody like this? People that are always worried about something when there's nothing to worry about? Just think about that. When there really isn't anything to fear and they're always afraid of something. It's always negative. It's all, oh, this is going to happen and, and, and that's going to happen and and, and they say this and they say that and we need to prepare for this and we need to prepare for that. What you need to prepare for is the Antichrist coming before Jesus Christ, but mainly before that ever happens, you need to prepare to ask for Jesus Christ into your life if you haven't already. That's what you need to prepare for. You need to believe and trust in him and then get involved in his word. And he will show you all these things. He'll show you, you you have nothing at all to fear about anything. Think about it. Because a person, now think about this, a person who fears is saying to God, I don't trust you. That's what they're saying. They may not say those words. But how can you fear when there's a true God who's more powerful than anything that has ever existed? If you fully trust in God and He's in your life, what do you got to fear about anything? You know how many people today fear death? Well, guess what? There are fools who believe there is no God. They fear death. Don't tell me that you believe that Jesus died for your sins and resurrected and ser were serving a living God if you fear death. Because death is just a transition from this old body that is breaking down into an eternal existence that has no sorrow, no pain, no suffering, and no death. And all those that have passed before, we will never have to say goodbye again when we see them again. Now that is what the truth is. The people who are in fear are in fear needlessly. Verse 5. There were they in great fear where no fear was. For God hath scattered the bones of him that encampeth against thee. Thou hast put them to shame because... God hath despised them. In other words, once you trust in God, once you trust in the Lord, you have nothing to fear. And all those naysayers out there, they're going to be the ones, they're going to be the ones that will be turning from God and will see that you will be promoted and they will be rejected. Now God doesn't want that for any of his children. But what he's telling you today, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. We don't want that to happen. God doesn't want it to happen. But it's going to happen. Why? Because there's some that are fools that are going to reject God. Even at the end of the millennial period where we had been with God for a thousand years, saints, sinner alike, we're all there. Still at the end of that millennial period, at the great white throne judgment, after Satan has been loose for, for a short period of time, there's still going to be people that will jump on Satan's bandwagon. 
verse 6. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, out of Israel, out of Jerusalem. When God bringeth back the captivity of his people, when he brings them back home, Jacob, meaning all the tribes, shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Does this happen today? No. This is future. This is after the two sticks are brought back together. This is after God's creation is all brought together again. And then we will be rejoicing. Because we won't have to deal with this stuff anymore at all but it will take Christ's return it will take Christ's teachings this will be after the great white throne judgment in the millennial period at the end of it when we will be with him for all eternity in a few minutes I want to do Psalm 54 it's important it's all important but listen to the chief musician and the guy enough Meshkel, a psalm of David, when the Ziphons came and said to Saul, Doth not David hide himself with us? And this is when David was in exile, and David was hiding himself. There was a period in time with this where David, um, he, uh, they thought King David was going to come up against them, but David was in an exile, and he needed protection, so... <laughs> So what God did, he had David act like a crazy man, scratching on the doors, on the gates, and foaming at the mouth, and going in his beard of spittle. And they're saying, oh, this, this dude's crazy, just let him go. We're, you know, he's not harmful or anything. Uh, telling us what? There's going to be times in your life that you might act a little differently before the world. But if you're following God, and what I mean by that, if you're following God, he's going to empower you to do what needs to be done to continue to do his work. I'll leave it there. But listen, David came to a point that he got real with God. And I pray this has already happened to you, but if it hasn't, there's going to come a point, and I pray it's today, that you're going to get real with God. Not, not, the, not the, 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 the formal prayers, or the, the formal churches, or the traditions of men. You're going to get one-on-one -on -one encounter with your eternal Father. It's going to be directly from your soul, directly from your heart to Him. And this might happen to you. It says in verse 1, Save me, O God. Save me, O God, by Thy name. And judge me by Thy strength. In other words, David's getting real with God. If there's sin in your life, you need to get real with God. Because sin cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you got sin, you're not getting there. You've got to have it removed. Now, you may get to the millennial period. But there'll still be sinners in the millennial period. But you're not going to get to the eternity. The millennial period is not the eternity for everyone. Because there are still people that are liable to die at the end of that millennial period. That will be blotted out from existence. And our Father doesn't want that for you. Now we're talking about those, we're not talking about now those that deny God. We're talking about those that are getting real with God. That know He's real. And realize that they're a sinner. And they need saving. That's what David's saying here. Verse 2. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. Lord, listen to me. Please, I beg you. I humbly come before you. This is real to me. 
God's going to know whether it's real or not. He's the heart knower. He's going to know if this is coming directly from your heart. And you don't have to say these exact words. Just be real with your father. Some of you have never been real your entire life. It's time to get real with God. Because he's real to you, you should get real with him. Verse 3. For strangers are risen up against me. You don't think strangers are up against you today? All around you. It could even be family members that are against you. They don't want you to succeed. They don't want you to be holy. They don't want you to be blessed. They want you to be as miserable as they are. But maybe you're tired of that misery. Maybe you're just plain tired of it all. You don't want to deal with it anymore. Well, God's there to change everything around. It doesn't mean any, anything's going to change out there. Family members or whatever, I pray that it does, but it might not. They're going to be just the same old miserable people as they've always been. But you're going to be different. Because for the first time in your life, you're getting real with God, as David did here. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. They don't believe in God. They don't trust God. So they don't want me to trust in Him either. They want me to be as bad off as they are. Or maybe even worse. They want me to fail. Behold, verse 4 says, God is mine helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. In other words, hey, I've got a few people out there, you know what? They encourage me. They know what I'm talking about. They're trying to help me. And they're upholding me. I want to turn from the bad ways. I want to be that better person. Well, there's people out there, believe it or not, that God has already called that will help you. How do I know? Because I'm living it. I've seen it during my life. A lot of times in my past, I didn't even know that they were there, that God sent them. But he did. You know, it reminds me of a time Billy Graham, before his passing, is mentioned about all the thousands of people that would come to his uh, um, revivals. And uh, somebody t said last week that he, he was told, I, I never heard this one, that only one or two percent was actually saved. But when I started thinking about that, that's like out of 60,000 people that are there, what's two percent? 600, you know, um, 60, doesn't matter. What's one soul worth to God? But I do remember Billy Graham saying that all the, the, the uh, revivals that he did, it wasn't his message at that moment that brought the masses forward to accept Christ. It was all the prayers, all the years, all the mothers, all the fathers, all the aunts, the uncles, the preachers, whatever it was, could have been hundreds of people praying for that individual. And it was God himself calling out to them that they answered the call. That's why Billy Graham always remained humble, as he should have. But in verse 4 it says, Behold, God is mine helper, I'm out of time, the Lord is with them that uphold my soul. Verse 5. He shall reward evil unto mine enemies. In other words, God's the revenge, uh, avenger. Cut them off in thy truth. In other words, they're not going to have understanding. Why? Because they don't want it. And God's going to cut it off for them. They don't want God? Guess what? They don't have to have God. Verse 6, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. 
And we covered sacrifice last week very well, I believe. He says, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. And finally in verse 7 to complete, For he hath delivered me. Hear this, it's important. He hath delivered me out of all trouble. Now do you believe he can do that or not? Because that's what it comes down to. Your faith in this. Your belief in it. Do you believe, and I don't care what kind of trouble you're in. I don't care whether it's drugs, alcoholism, prostitution, uh, uh, spouse abuse.